So, hi and welcome everybody to the second part of OFDM transmission technique used in 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, Li-Fi, ADSL, DVB, DVA, and many other wireless communication systems. So we talked about the spectrum of the OFDM signal and we said as the input power reduces minus 25 dB for example, the out of band emission, I mean by the out of band emission, the side, the, the, this part, this part, this is very problematic in OFDM. I want this to be as small as possible, as small as possible. If I, if I can make it like this, it would be much better. Why? Because here, here, why, why, is, why is this important? Because here I want to add another, another OFDM signal for another user. So basically, if this is the case, the red one, so this means that it, causing, it causes interference to the other one. And the signal-to-noise ratio at this user will be bad. That's why I don't like this, and I don't want this to happen. Therefore, I the goal here to reduce it as much as we can. How to do that? How to reduce this? Either you reduce the input power, but in this case you cannot amplify your signal too much, or use windowing. What's windowing? Basically, here you have your OFDM symbol, and you have this part. Yes? Do you see with me this part? This, the, the curved one. The curved one, this one, and this one. So basically here, this is kind of window. Makes the transition between the OFDM symbols very smooth. Since the transition is very smooth, the out-of-band emission will be reduced because the, the, the out-of-band emission or the high side loops have been usually due to sharp transition. Why sharp transition? Because sharp transition is like rect. What's the Fourier transform of rect? Sync with so many side loops that keep oscillating to infinity. We don't want this to happen. If you can make it a little bit smoother in time domain, you will make it more confined in the frequency. So basically, this is what we do in order to solve this problem. And you want your spectrum to be below the mask. We call it power spectral density below certain mask. This is your spectrum in MATLAB, and this is the spectrum that you can see in MATLAB or in a hardware device from a signal you captured from the air. This is in the frequency domain, one O of the M symbol in the frequency domain, and this is in time domain. Take the Fourier transform of this, you get this. And this is the mask defined by the standard. You, you have to, after you simulate your OFTM symbol, you have to be under this mask. If you are above this mask, you, you, your design cannot be accepted by the standard. It's not good. So basically, this is defined by the standard. We call it the mask. And we want to make sure that the power spectral density is below the, these borders. How do you do that? With windowing, as I just show you, you add another smooth function at the end of the symbol and at the beginning. And without windowing, you get this blue curve. With windowing, you get this red one. See how, how much you reduce the side loops from minus 50 dB to minus 80, which is really, really very significant and very useful. What else we have as problems for OFDM? The phase noise. And when you have an ideal local oscillator and you multiply it by with the subcarriers, you get ideal subcarriers response where there is no interference between them. At, at, at the peak of the first subcarrier, you get zero from the other subcarriers and the same for the other subcarriers. But when you have local oscillator, yes, that's practical, what do you get? You get some spreading here. 
So at the peak of this subcarrier, do you have zero contributions from the other subcarriers? Do you have zero, for example, at the peak here? Yes? Here the peak. Do I have zero here from all the other subcarriers? No? No, this is not zero. This is not zero. This, is, this causes interference. This, this case, yes, it was zero. At this, zero. At the peak here, the value of the other function is zero. But here, at the peak here, the value of the other functions are not zero. Yes? It's not zero at all. So basically, what we do here when you have ICI, you need to get rid of that. You need to remove the effect of this because this is bad. This kills the orthogonality of your system. And if the orthogonality of your system is destroyed, your communication is fully destroyed. So it's really bad, not good at all. What do you do? So basically, we want to remove this phase noise as much as we can. So basically what we do is the following. We try to estimate this phase noise, the value of it, and after that compensate it. Just like estimating the channel and compensating its effect by equalization. So you estimate how much this value is and you try to subtract it or remove its effect. This is how you how the frequency offset affect your subcarriers. So basically when you have shift in, the, in some of the subcarriers, the orthogonality destroys. At the peak of this, you are not getting zeros from the others. Kills your communication. The same here. That was in the frequency domain. What about in time domain? How do you see that? This is in time domain, your signal. And you draw it in the constellation diagram I and the Q. So, and you see kind of circular behavior here. Instead of seeing one point, you see like many points adjacent to each other in a form of a circle. And here in the, in the frequency domain, in the carrier, you have your data, which is the blue, and you have the red one, which is the carrier offset. So basically, you try to estimate this so that you subtract it. In math, so we explained it by word, by visualization, and by math. If you understand all these different types of explanation and relate them with each other, then you can convey your message scientifically. Not only by words, but only also by visualization and math. By math, you have, what's the effect when you have frequency offset? You have alpha a plus rho. Rho is fractional part. This is what makes the frequency offset. It's not integer part. So basically, you want to estimate rho, what's rho, how much is rho, and compensate it. Frequency offset, for example, when you don't have frequency offset, how do you see your constellation point? The red ones, you see them clear. But when you have frequency offset of 0 0.05, which means 5%, what do you see? You see the cloudy ones, these blue ones. How, can you figure out your symbol when you have a cloudy uh, constellation points? It becomes harder and more difficult to de detect your symbol. So this figure shows you the constellation diagram of the modulated symbol in the IQ when ICI is equal to zero, here when ICI is increased a little bit, and here when it is 
70% and here when it is 15%. So you can see, you can prove here, show that as the ICI increases, the distortion increases because your, your points here in the constellation diagram are no longer clear and solid at a fixed position, but rather they are fuzzy and cloudy. So it becomes very difficult to estimate your data correctly. And this is in the frequency domain. When the carrier offset increases, your ICI power increases. ICI power increases more effect on your data symbols. ICI because intercarrier interference, it's interference bad to your communication. Timing mismatch, another problem that OFDM suffers from. Timing offset smaller than guard interval results in phase shift. If it is smaller than time interval, if the time offset smaller than the guard interval, this causes phase shift. Causes rotation of symbols, does not affect the orthogonality. Channel estimation can take care of it. While you are estimating the channel and trying to equalize, this will be included. Otherwise, if, if the offset, the phase shift, due to time mismatch is more than the guard interval, then you will have intersymbol interference. Best solution is to choose sufficient guard interval to provide some robustness against timing mismatch. So the guard interval also is useful for timing mismatch. Yes, not only to prevent multipath fading effect and to provide circularity, but also for timing mismatch. So, the most simplified OFDM system view can be shown here, where you have your data in, which are uh, complex numbers in the frequency domain. You take IE50, and then you pass it, you, you go to the time domain, you pass it through the channel, and then you take FFT, and you go to the output. And here, the blue one shows the data part of your signal, and the green one here, the cyclic prefix, and here the cyclic prefix. As you can see, the end part of the signal and the beginning part, they are exactly the same. Why? Because they, the, here basically is the CB. You take the last part and you add it to the beginning. So it's copy based. And this is when you have timing offset, you get this constellation shape. Instead of getting grid points, you get the blue ones. So they are not they are with timing error. And as you increase the timing error, if you have timing offset within CB, you get this shape. So in the exam, if I bring you this shape and tells you, does this show timing offset? Is this timing offset within the CB or more than the CB? Is this with timing offset or without timing offset? This without timing offset, perfect. Perfect constellation points. This with timing offset, but the timing offset is falls within the CB duration. This D curve is timing offset beyond the CB duration. With timing offset outside CB. Means it causes not only offset, but intersymbol interference because the guard band, it exceeded the guard band. The guard band is short, not that long enough to prevent it. So now look at this frequency, channel frequency response. Yes. You have subcarrier with large channel gain, subcarrier with low channel gain, and subcarrier with medium. For this point one, point one, what's the constellation diagram? is this somehow clear if you put if i tell you detect the symbols here what do you do you draw boundaries and you say anything here belongs to this quadrant anything here belongs to quadrant two anything here belongs to quadrant three anything here belongs to quadrant four but if you go to position two if you receive your signal over the channel over channel at position number two, where the channel gain is not as big as, uh, is not as high as one. 
What do you get? You put boundary, you try to put boundary. As you can see, the points here are crossing to the other boundaries. Means you decide on them wrongly. The points here are crossing here. The points here are crossing. So you don't know. Your bit error rate is bad. You cannot detect all the bits correctly. You go to point number three here where you get low, extremely low channel gain. And you try to draw the boundary here. Can you determine where is your symbol in which quadrant? Your bit error rate is so bad here. So this is point three. This is where your bit error rate is almost 0 0.5. Half of your bits are in error. But point two has much is better, 10 to minus two, and point one is 10 to minus four. This is the bit error rate drawing for different locations based on the channel. With additive white Gaussian noise without the channel, you get this green one. 10 to minus 2 always. What does this mean? This means that the channel can either amplify your signal and make it better, as is the case with 1, or make it worse, the bit error rate, as is the case with 2 and 3. Yes, when you have channel, your bit error rate performance can be better than the additive white gas and noise without channel if it amplifies like this point. But if it is in this point, it becomes worse, very worse. Very critical this. To be understood and relate them with each other as it's really very important. Coded OFDM. We also use coded OFDM. Coded OFDM to protect against the noise. We use error correction in OFDM. Example in error correction, forward error correction. It basically adds redundant bit to your data stream to protect it against noise. Example on that, convolutional codes, flop codes. It basically mitigates the effect of noise and the bad channel. You remember these bad channels here? You saw it's, it's like this, three. Can you determine where is your symbol is located? You cannot. And the bit error rate is so bad. To solve this problem, you use forward error correction. Forward error correction adds redundant bit to protect you from this case. Reduces over your all throw, but since you add redundant bit, which are not necessary for transmitting additional bit, but for protection, your throughput reduces because what's a, what's a throughput? The net data bits you transmit within a duration or within the resources you have. Duration or frequency? Is it the only way to protect our data? No, we have also automatic repeat request. Automatic repeat request says the following. Send my packet to the receiver. Let the receiver try to decode it. If the receiver couldn't decode the packet successfully, retransmit the same packet one more time. When I retransmit the packet again, the packet will go over a different channel. Hopefully, it's better than the previous one. So the receiver combines the data that he received in the first round with the data he received in the second round softly in an intelligent way and tries to get the data back correctly. As error detecting ability, Cyclic redundancy checks. It checks whether there is an error due to channel or not. If there is, ask the transmitter, send NAC message. Say, I didn't receive it, please transmit again. He trans the receiver transmits the signal again. You combine it and you get your data back. It's used in most of the wireless communication system, this mechanism. Typical coded OFDM, you have the data bits you are transmitting. You have parity bits. So basically, let's say you have 100 bits here. Yes, 100 bits. And you want to protect your data with coding grade half, you add another 100 bits. These are data. These are protection. So what happens here? You reduce your throughput by half. You reduce your throughput, increase the delay, and uses more power. What are the disadvantages of forward error correction? If I tell you forward error correction, why do we use it to protect our data? True? If I tell you, why do we use forward error correction? To detect error and recover them. 
recover the, the bits and errors. So basically, it enhances your bit error rate. If you want to enhance your bit error rate more, the first method to use is to use forward error correction, channel coding. However, you do it at the expense of what? What are the disadvantages with channel coding? You transmit another 100 bits unnecessarily, just for protection. You are not transmitting, using them to transmit data. So loss causes loss in the throughput. What else? You transmit to SunDisk, you use power. Loss in the power. What else? To transmit this, you must use more time. Means you increase the delay. Wow. All these disadvantages, and you are still using getting wireless communication systems. Don't we have something better than this? Who will take this as a project? Your project, the title of, the, of your project will be like this. Why the hell people are still using forward error correction if it has all these disadvantages? Don't we have another better solution? Write it down, write it down. I want this to work on it with somebody. Why are we still using forward error correction if it still has all these disadvantages? First, what are the disadvantages? You tell me when you come to meet me in the office. The disadvantages of forward error correction. Increases complexity. The circuit that you designed to produce channel coding increases the complexity significantly. Increases the delay. Wastes power. Wastes power, you lose it. And reduces the throughput. How many disadvantages? Four. Is this suitable for Internet of Things applications? No, no, no. <clears throat> Why do we still use it? Just because it provides better bit error rate? Don't we have another better algorithm or better modulation scheme that can provide better bit error rate without sacrificing these things? This is the question you need to answer. Don't we have a better transmission algorithm that can reduce the disadvantages of these things while we are still having good bit error rate. This is what you wrote now. This is a research problem. This is a well-defined research problem. I told you the first task to do something useful to know your problem. And this problem has to make sense. Yes? Has to make sense. And do we do you feel that there is a need to solve it? Yes, there is a need because now, nowadays, the internet, the communication in the future is for Internet of Things devices. It's not for bulky phones or these only these phones that are powerful in processing and computational power. Even, yes, they are not for these phones. We are designing our future networks for the Internet of Things also. What are the features of the Internet of Things? Low complexity, but coding high complexity. We want to save power because this Internet of Things device has limited power, but coding is uses more, wastes more power. We need to reduce the time, transmission time because these sensing data are very important, but the coding uses more time. We need better throughput, but coding reduces the throughput. Is using coding for Internet of Things is still justifiable in our current systems? This is the question that we need to answer. Of course, when you say no, then what else? Show me a method that works better than this. What the solution you will come up with in this course will to say that this is better, to be accepted by the community, to convince the reviewers, to convince the world, to convince the companies, and let them use it and forget about forward error correction, your method should at least provide the same reliability as the forward error correction while reducing the other disadvantages of forward error correction. Clear the goal. Everybody wrote these things. Everybody will discuss these things with me. If I'm forgetting something, let me know. 
clear? Now we define this, we can write a project out of it. To European Union Horizon, this, to the big companies. We have something. We have a case, don't we? I'm teaching you how to think and come up with projects, ideas, papers, patents, something, teaching you how to think. If you define this properly and motivate it well, you will have, you can have funding from the government or from the companies to work on this problem. Because they will say this guy knows what he's doing and if he can solve this problem, this will be a very good advantage for us. Teaching you this process. If you, what I said, if you can formulate it in a proposal, I will prove to you that how this can bring you value. Because it makes sense to me. We need to solve this problem within this course. Hopefully, I need to pick a few students and work with them on this problem. On this problem and solve it. And write a proposal out of it, hopefully. And form a team or something. Establish a research area on this domain. Do we still need to use forward error correction while having all these problems related with it? While we are having Internet of Things devices? I think it's worth answering. It's worth developing some algorithms that work better than forward error correction. So after modulation, after coding, we do modulation and we try map the bits to constellation points here, as you can see. Each one has its own region. This is 16 equal. <laughs> and at the receiver, we try to detect our symbols and see which one is located in which location. Renumbering of subcarriers between physical and logical map. The subchannels are renumbered or shuffled throughout the symbol when they are being mapped from logical to physical mapping. This mapping and shuffling is actually to avoid uh, burst errors. Burst errors happens, you know burst errors? Everybody knows burst errors? When you have a channel in deep fade like this, remains in deep fade, deep fade, and goes up. So all the subcarriers, all the subcarriers that are corresponding to this duration, they will be in error. If you have too many subcarriers adjacent to each other in error, will you get your message correctly? Barely. So if you have an error, for example, if you have the word read, read. And this, this word read is carried by three subcarriers here. And all of them, they experience bad subchannel, then the word will be deleted. But if you shuffle the subcarriers, let only one of, the, one of the carriers carrying read go through this, and the others go through the good ones, then what you will receive at the receiver, you will receive like this, read. The D is missing maybe because the channel is bad, I couldn't correct it. But you can guess what's it. Yes? You can guess because only one letter is eliminated. But if you allow burst errors, you have all the whole word in error. You don't know even what's the word. You have no chance of guessing. You understood what's the importance of shuffling? Renumbering? I think it's a good idea to avoid these kind of errors. Yes, don't you think so? I think so. This is the channel. They, they came here. Instead of letting it a frequency, I shuffle it. Part of it, I send it here, and the other part on the good ones, so that you don't have always consecutive errors. Uplink OFDM symbol. In the case of tra uplink transmission, you have user 1 that has different channel, user 2 with different channel, and user 3. Uh, only two users, you don't have user 3. And you want to transmit your signal to the base station. So the base station say to this user, look, you are bad in the first part. In the first part of the channel, you, you, your response, your channel response is really bad. So let me allow this user to transmit. I don't want you to transmit. In the second part, oh, your channel is good now. See, it, it's up, it's up, and this is down. 
Okay, I am gonna allow you now to transmit. Transmit your data, please. So, the base station instruct the users at which time you can transmit or on which frequencies you can transmit based on the channel behavior. By doing so, you ensure that they transmit always when the channel response is good. This means your bit error rate will be always good and your capacity, system capacity, will be much better. Clear? Different user signals go through different frequency selective channels. Channel estimation is more challenging. You do this scheduling for users. I think it's an important concept. What about in uplink when the user, some of them is near the base station, some of the users are near, and some are far. Some of the users are far. So what do you do here? You allow them to transmit anytime they like, anytime they want. What will happen if they transmit anytime they like, anytime they want? They will cause like interference with each other. Because some will arrive now, some will arrive later, some will arrive after a while, and they interfere with each other. We want to avoid this problem. We want to make sure that the base station, when it processes the, the received data from all the users, it processes at the same time. So, the base station talks to the car, tells the car, you are the farthest user from me. Please start your transmission earlier than this guy by T3. So this guy started transmitting first. Then this guy, which is closer a little bit, and then this guy, which is closer, the closest. Since the farthest started earlier in transmission by certain time, the base station adjusts this time so that the transmission, at the, when they reach the receiver, all of them reach at the same time. Since they reach at the same time, we call them synchronized. Synchronized. Since they are synchronized, the, the base station can process the data of each user without interference. Clever ideas. Problem for the case when you have uplink. As you can see, each slide is a problem and the related solution. The same you will do with your project. You will come up with your own slide that we will put it in the in these slides that we will teach to the next students who will come after you. So we will say that Zubair found this problem and he solved it using this solution. So it becomes part of the literature. We teach it to the other students of the year and to the world, of course, when you publish it. Well, this is what we are doing, basically, giving, giving you examples of problems and their solutions so that you can think similar, similarly. This is all of the M system structure ar architecture. We already explained it to you before. Again, binary data, modulation, pilot insertions, and then I-50, CB insertion, and then P, P to S is parallel to serial. This block gives you parallel data. You need to transfer it to serial. Why? Because you have to transmit it in time. In time, you transmit symbol by symbol. And then over the channel, and then you have additive white Gaussian noise, and you have photo detector. This is for which of the, this is for the case when you are sending uh, light. When you are using the light to send data, we call it Li-Fi. CB removal, FFT, channel estimation, interpolation, then equalization, decoding, and remapping, and you get your data back. So this by block diagram and visualization. What about math? What about math? How do you mathematically model your OFDM signal? Transmitted signal can be obtained using a discrete Fourier transform. So basically, you have, this is your OFDM signal. Everybody with me, this is important. Yes, this is, this, this notation, this one, is your OFDM signal, X of T. This mathematical notation is equal to the summation of the data the modulated data points, which are the complex numbers, multiplied by the exponential basis function. 
So basically, these E to J, 2 by K delta FT are the columns of the IFFT. If from K 0 to N minus 1, the dimension of the matrix N by N. So you take all the columns one by one, and the first column in the IFFT matrix, which represents the first exponential function, the first signal, you multiply it by the first data symbol you want to transmit. It can be QAM, it can be PBSK, 16 QAM, whatever. And then plus the second one, second exponential function with the second data symbol, plus third one until you reach the number of exponential basis function you have, which is determined by the I-50 size, the size of the matrix. Let's say N. So you have N number of exponential functions, each multiplied with a data symbol. And then you get the, your signal, the OFDM signal you transmit over the air and goes through the channel. Now, does this remind you of anything in signal and system? Signal and system, of course. This equation looks like Fourier transform. Yes. Fourier transform, what do you have? You have here C's, complex coefficients, and you have the exponential function E2 minus J2 by F0 NT. This is similar, exactly similar. And you have here G of T. Yes, the, the signal. And it was periodic. So the signal here, the OFDM signal, is combined of multiple exponential basis function, each one multiplied by a complex data symbol in the frequency domain. So either I give you this or this, they are the same. Now this is in time continuous. If you want to sample it, what's the sampling? You divide T as the duration of the symbol over the number of points in FTT. So you get instead of T, you get N, N small over N T S, and you get this instead of this. Since delta F T S is equal one when the OFDM system is orthogonal, you get finally this which is exactly equal to this. The complex data point in frequency domain, if you take their IDFT, you go to the time domain OFDM signal. The IDFT basically performs this operation, this with a summation. By math is important because at the end of the day, you need to write your math First, you write it by words, you explain it, and you make sense out of it, and you discuss it with your teacher, with your friends, and then, and you search on Google that it's not written, and then you explain it by math, and then you simulate it. And then you get the results, you are done. Clear? I think this very nice, good example, where you learn how to implement an idea, and do the necessary stuff. This is for the case where you have ICI. When you have ICI, you for all the carriers that are not on the same carrier, you find the contribution of them to the main subcarrier. And this for calculating calculating the frequency offset and the value of it. So basically, we stop here, and next lecture we continue with the OFDM system design. Thank you very much for your attention and for your patience and meet you next time.